Hi, this is Clint Woods with the Association of Air Pollution Control Agencies. Uh, this is our uh, webinar on background ozone. I uh, wanted to make a few quick comments at the beginning, and we've got, uh, we're lucky to be joined by a couple of uh, experts from, uh, from federal agencies on the topic of today, which is uh, background ozone. Uh, so just a couple logistical items for everyone. Uh, we have 75 minutes set aside for this webinar. I know we're getting started a couple minutes late. Uh, but at any point, feel free to type questions that you have uh, into the, the webinar box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll, we'll make sure to get those asked. Um, we'll be circulating the slides from these presentations to, to the APCA membership uh, here in the next 24 hours. And, uh, and please feel free, if you have any technical issues, to, to go ahead and use that chat box in the, uh, the GoToWebinar. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have a couple of, of federal agencies joining us today to talk about background ozone issues. Uh, particularly timely as, as state and local agencies are looking at preparing comments on, on EPA's uh, background ozone white paper that was released in December and, and also proposed exceptional events rule revisions uh, as well as wildfire guidance for ozone events. Uh, we have uh, Mike Korber and, and Pat Dolick from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards who we're going to have speak first and then following up we'll have uh, some additional speakers uh, from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's uh, Earth Systems Research Lab, and in particular the Chemical Sciences Division, to discuss some, some recent scientific developments. They've been pursuing uh, some tools that, that may be on the horizon for state and local agencies as they consider background ozone under a revised ozone max. Um, and so with that, in, in the interest of everybody's time, we'll go ahead and turn things over uh, to Mike Korber and Pat Dolick of US EPA. Um, they have a few slides that they're going to be talking through to provide a, a overview of their, their background ozone white paper and then provide any clarifying questions and I think also touch on the workshop that will be held in late February in Phoenix. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn things over. Mike, are, are, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me okay, Clint? Yes. Very good. So Pat's going to go through the slides, but I just wanted to say a couple words to, to kick this off. Um, in terms of background ozone, we, of course, recently went through an a ozone max rulemaking process, and as part of that, we heard a lot from a number of people about the significance of background ozone. Um, as, as you all know, on October 1st, in conjunction with that rulemaking, Janet McCabe issued a memo which addressed a number of important implementation topics, including background ozone. That October 1st memo did acknowledge that there were a few high elevation locations in the western U.S. that could face attainment challenges due to background ozone. And the memo also pointed to existing Clean Air Act tools for dealing with high background levels caused by certain natural events like wildfires and stratospheric intrusions. The memo went on to say that to ensure that all stakeholders have a, a common understanding of background ozone um, in order to uh, also, uh, make sure that everybody has a better understanding of how it can be account how background ozone could be accounted for and implementing the ozone standards. EPA was planning to do two things: one, issue a white paper, which we released on December 22nd, and also hold a workshop, which, as Clint mentioned, we're planning to do on February 24th and 25th, and that will be in Phoenix. Um, Pat's going to go through now and, and talk a little more uh, about what's actually in the white paper, maybe plans for the workshop as well, but. I'd like to note that there are some related actions that we have going on at this time uh, that do uh, touch on background ozone. There's the exceptional events rulemaking, which was signed back on November 10th, published on November 20th, and the comment period is currently open. That goes through February 3rd. Um, also, we've said that we will be issuing ozone designations guidance early in 2016, um, and we have a, a draft that we're currently working on. And then finally, the October 1st memo pointed to an ozone implementation rule um, that we would be developing for the 2015 ozone standard. Uh, while we don't have a time frame specifically for that implementation rule, I think we have said that we'd like to finalize that uh, in the same time frame that the ozone designations are finalized. So that would be uh, in the late 2017 time frame. So that's our, our goal for that particular rulemaking. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Pat, and he'll walk through the slides. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, so if we can go to slide two. Um, so Mike covered most of this. Um, so this relates back to the McCabe memo on October 1st, um, where EPA announced plans for both this white paper on background ozone and the workshop. Um, 
And so the, the goal of the white paper is sort of a, um, I guess, prerequisite document uh, intended to be kind of background on 101 um, and establish a sort of foundational understanding uh, for any subsequent conversations on background ozone. So uh, to put to paper EPA's sort of condensed um, collective understanding of, of the issue of background ozone, um, you know, the quantity uh, uh, of background ozone, uh, where, when, how, um, and then how it relates to uh, various Clean Air Act provisions. Um, and then the specific goal of the workshop was to um, sort of, you know, starting with that white paper understanding uh, to further advance our uh, collective understanding uh, as the air quality regulation community of technical and policy issues related to, to background. Um, so the next slide, please. So as Mike said, the, the white paper was released on, released on December 22nd. Uh, you can find it online at that link. Um, or, yeah, following that link. Um, and then the, the workshop, which will be held in Phoenix at the uh, Arizona Department of Air Environmental Quality on the 24th and 25th of February, um, a Wednesday, Thursday. Um, the agenda for the workshop, and I'll talk a little bit about it in subsequent slides, and registration is, is open online at www.epa.gov slash ozone pollution slash registration.html. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, let me just in summary form, uh, for those that haven't had a chance to, to look at the white paper yet, um, sort of walk through the, the outline. So um, there's a short overview which sort of goes through uh, the purpose. Uh, but then uh, we get into some of the um, basics of background ozone. So um, multiple definitions of background, including um, a key one from EPA's perspective, um, we've used this term uh, U.S. background or USB, uh, which we define to be any ozone formed from sources or processes other than uh, U.S. anthropogenic um, emissions of ozone precursors. Um, we talk a little bit about the sources of, of USB ozone and ways in which um, that quantity is estimated, uh, particularly through either rural uh, monitoring networks, which can get you part of the way to estimating USB, or uh, photochemical um, grid modeling tools. Then there's a section, I think the third section in the white paper talks about current estimates of background ozone. Um, so won't claim that this is an um, all-inclusive uh, set, uh, but we walked through some of the studies that are available in the peer review literature, as well as some additional work that was done here at EPA. And I should say this is um, leveraging highly a lot of the work that was done as part of the um, ozone Act rulemaking. Uh, so the integrated science assessment, the policy assessment, the regulatory impact analyses, all the documentation that went into the October 2015 NACS revision um, is sort of condensed in uh, this part of the white paper. Uh, the fourth section talks about uh, future estimates, uh, not just of background ozone, but of ozone itself. Um, so we talk about some recent EPA 2025 projection modeling. Uh, we talk about some of the work that I think our NOAA colleagues are going to go through later in terms of looking at trends in mid-tropospheric ozone levels and, and what the implications of those trends may be. And then in the fifth section, we talk about sort of a, uh, what we're calling a preliminary conceptual model of ozone NACS planning. So um, one of the key elements of the white paper is table two, uh, where we've combined uh, the most recent official ozone design values, so from the three-year period 2012 to 2014, combine that with countywide um, NOx estimates from the 2011 National Emissions Inventory um, and also with some EPA source apportionment modeling that was done for the year 2017 as part of our transport rule modeling. And so combining those three quantities, so the, the quote-unquote current design values along with uh, somewhat current inventory estimates and near future um, estimates of how 
what U.S. background levels are at individual counties throughout the U.S. Um, we divvied the, the country up into sort of three zones from a uh, from the perspective of background ozone and its its role in implementation of a new standard. Um, so eastern U.S., California, and uh, rest of the western U.S. and and that's sort of a along the uh, spectrum of where we think the implementation issues are going to be most severe, um, sort of least severe in the eastern U.S., um, sort of more so than in California, and then uh, potentially um, appreciably so in the Intermountain West. From there, we go into a, a, a quick overview of the policy tools. So we're talking about things like the exceptional event rule, and Mike mentioned the, the proposed revisions to that rule, um, which are out for review right now. Um, so, you know, exceptional events can um, prevent, or, or let's see, let's step back. The If one can make a, I think most of the folks on this call know this, but if one can make a demonstration that an exceedance of a standard would not have occurred, um, but for the uh, an exceptional event as defined um, in the act, then that particular exceedance can be removed from your design value calculations and thus wouldn't go into um, any um, non-attainment designation considerations. Um, so to the extent that we have events like um, stratospheric uh, intrusions or perhaps ozone formed in um, plumes from wildfires, um, to the extent that those can be demonstrated to be exceptional events, um, that may result in, in some of the areas where uh, background ozone plays a larger role than other areas. Uh, for those particular event-driven exceedances to come out of the designation uh, planning process. Other policy tools, um, and obviously we'll get into these in much more detail at the workshop, include um, a provision of the Act 182H, which talks about rural transport areas. So if you, um, there's some sort of logistical considerations uh, required by the Act in terms of uh, whether or not you're in a um, metropolitan statistical area or adjacent to one. Uh, but assuming you don't meet either of those two criteria and you can show that you don't appreciably influence your own ozone or any downwind ozone, you might be eligible for a rural transport area uh, classification. Uh, we also talk about in the designations process as we, um, you know, collectively working with our co-regulators, uh, state governments and, and local entities as we draw what are considered to be appropriate non-attainment boundaries, non-attainment area boundaries, um, how might we consider background ozone in that process. And then finally, there's a provision in the Act in Section 179B which talks about um, areas that would attain but for uh, contributions from international emissions. Uh, so the white paper uh, sort of uh, gives a quick description of each of those Cleaner Act provisions that relate to background and uh, sort of tees up uh, what we hope will be a more detailed discussion about how you apply those tools um, at the workshop. Um, I think then the next couple slides will talk through um, some of the questions that the white paper uh, teed up for further discussion. So these aren't, this is I guess EPA's um, expectation of some of the questions that our co-regulators and other stakeholders are going to have, um, but certainly they don't represent the entire universe of possible questions. So our hope is that um, this community, the APCA community will those that are planning on attending the workshop would come with questions for, for further discussion. But basically, uh, the ones that are identified in the white paper sort of uh, can probably be summed into, I guess, two main groups. Um, has EPA properly characterized background ozone and its role in implementation of the 2015 NACs? Um, so there's a lot of sub-elements there. There are alternate definitions of background uh, that people believe need to be considered. Um, are there additional analyses or modeling simulations? I'm looking forward to hearing what, what David and his colleagues have to say because I, I know um, they did a recent paper, uh, Policy Perspectives in, in Science, that spoke to this. But are there additional analyses, modeling simulations, modeling process improvements um, that need to be undertaken for uh, future assessments of background ozone? What improvements do we need to better characterize background levels across the U.S.? 
Um, so that's sort of all under the, the broad, um, as EPA properly characterized background ozone. And then if you advance the slide, uh, sort of the second uh, broad set of questions would be, um, you know, aside from the characterization of background ozone on the technical side, from a policy perspective, is EPA properly characterized the statutory mechanisms by which these issues, the issues that relate to background, could be addressed as part of implementation of the 2015 standard. Uh, so there's a lot of sub-elements there in terms of our are there other approaches aside from um, the four that we've identified that could be considered? Um, has EPA made sufficient tools or guidance available to make these demonstrations? Um, do stakeholders um, want, uh, require, need um, additional assistance from EPA to develop the, ne the necessary demonstrations? Um, those are sort of the second set of questions that we expect that a minimum would be discussed at the workshop, certainly. Um, we encourage others to bring either different broad sets of questions or more specific questions within those two sets. Excuse me, those two sets. Um, slide six. So just quickly on the workshop details. Um, while it's a two-day workshop, um, we're intending to um, limit the first day to sort of our um, co-regulator community, so states, local, uh, and tribal agencies, including um, RPOs, um, EPA regional offices, um, but we don't, uh, we're, we're limiting day one to that group. It won't be open to the public. And then day two is intended for all stakeholders, including those from day one um, that want to participate in day two as well. And then day two will also be open to the public. Um, the agenda actually has been finalized now, um, and it's online at the link that was in slide two, uh, but the agenda does look like this still. And I should say up front, what we're hoping to do is to uh, limit the amount of time that, that EPA is talking and maximize the amount of time that the audience is talking. Um, we're, we're shooting for sort of a one-third, two-third ratio there, so EPA would sort of tee up, give a sort of a quick review of the white paper, on these particular topics and then open it uh, to the workshop uh, participants for uh, additional conversations. So um, basically there's uh, four key topics of the, our estimates um, and then we move into the, the policy tools. So we'll have a section on exceptional event considerations, uh, non-attainment area boundaries in rural transport areas and then international transport. And then we hope to reserve uh, at least two hours at the end of each day for, for open discussion. So if there's anything outside that agenda or if there's um, time to synthesize all of those various elements, uh, we hope to do that at the open discussion. Next slide. Uh, so the bottom line on, on both the white paper and the workshop is, you know, as, as Mike said at the uh, get-go, um, EPA is interested in evaluating the need for further guidance and or rules to address background ozone. Uh, and we want to receive feedback on this white paper, um, both at the workshop and afterwards. And so the plan is we're going to establish a non-regulatory docket. Um, this, um, the, the date hasn't really been finalized yet, but tentatively targeting that there will be a sort of open, this docket will be open through the end of March. Um, whereby, um, you know, any stakeholder or any group uh, that wants to provide feedback on sort of any issue related to background ozone, either in the white paper, at the workshop, or, or outside those two um, entities is, is welcome to do so. Um, as Mike said up front, we're hoping to reserve a lot of the really technical uh, discussions so that we have them out at least um, you know, in the open. There will be transcripts for, for each day. I should have said we don't have a webinar capability, uh, but we will make all presentations available and there will be a transcript for those that can't attend. Uh, if you have any questions about how the workshop's being set up, uh, the contact is Yvonne Johnson. Her email address is on the slide. And if you have any questions about the white paper, um, that's me. So I think, uh, as Clint said, we'd be glad to take any sort of clarifying questions or um, if, uh, if we missed anything, um, try to answer those questions now. Great. Well, thanks so much to, to Pat and Mike for, for that, uh, that, that overview of the white paper. And I think answered a lot of questions as, as folks are looking at that February 24th and 25th workshop in Phoenix.
I, I don't think we have any questions right now, although we'll maybe wait just 10 seconds here and let folks, if you have any clarifying questions for, for OAQPS on the white paper or the workshop, feel free to type those in in your webinar box. Um, and if we don't get to them, we can uh, obviously send those on after, after today's webinar. But, but thank you again to US EPA. And I think now we'll go ahead and, and turn things over to, to uh, uh, we're joined by, by several experts at NOAA's Earth Systems Research Lab, uh, their Chemical Sciences Division. Uh, and, and I know we've got a number of, of supplemental slides. And, and uh, as folks know, if there's any particular slide you'd like us to bring up, we're, we're happy to do so. But I want to thank you all so much for uh, being willing to join us and talk a little bit about, about what NOAA's been working on as it relates to the background ozone and, and kind of what, what's, uh, what's likely to be out there in the future that state and local air agencies may, may want to be looking at in terms of background ozone science. Okay, Clint, can you hear me now? Hello? Yep, 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 we can hear you. Yeah, good. So I'm David Fahey, Director of the Chemical Sciences Division here at uh, NOAA's Earth System Research Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and I have, uh, we're all here in one room, and I'm also here with my deputy, Eric Williams, who uh, participates a lot in this. And in addition, there are four, what I would call ozone scientists for the terms of today. Uh, the first one is Owen Cooper, who will lead our conversation, our presentation today, who is uh, very well invested in this uh, topic. And uh, I think um, Pat mentioned the science policy forum piece that we had published last June. It's only a two-page um, narrative about this issue from the science perspective. Owen was the lead author of that, and the other people in the room were co-authors. I could recommend uh, Clint uh, somehow sh um, affording that link to the listening audience here, because that really encapsulates where we're coming from as a federal science agency. So uh, um, and then also in the room is uh, Andy Langford, who has worked quite a bit on stratospheric intrusions of ozone that affect uh, surface uh, amounts. Michael Trainer, who's uh, one of our modeling group that tries to understand how ozone changes due to a variety of features, and David Parrish, who is uh, very well invested in trends of ozone, both nationally and, and globally. So we're all sitting here. There's a lot of horsepower, as you can imagine, in the room. Uh, we don't want to take all the time either. Owen has uh, sent Clint a rather extensive presentation that we can randomly access. I think he's going to open the discussion today with 10 or 15 minutes uh, browsing through that to kind of tell you, give you a taste of where we're coming from, and then we'll uh, be quiet and, and hope that the conversation will discussion will be picked up uh, through questions, etc. So, okay, um, unless Clint has any um, input here, Owen, why don't you uh, call out your uh, slides? Okay, great. Um, so I'm Owen Cooper at the University of Colorado in, in Noah Ezrol, and I want to start off in this discussion on background ozone by standing back as far as we possibly can to look at uh, background ozone from a northern hemisphere, even a, a global perspective. And to do that, um, we need satellites. We can go to uh, the next slide, please. And this, this is a brand new result. Um, my colleagues here in the room haven't even seen this yet. And I'm really excited about this. Um, my good colleague at um, NASA Goddard, Jerry Zinka, has been working very hard for 12 years now processing um, ozone measurements from the RS satellite using both OMI and MLS instruments. And if you take the difference between the two, you get a, a tropospheric column. And what I'm showing in the, in the time series here is the full aura time series of his OMI MLS tropospheric ozone burden product. And it starts in October of 2004, and we just updated it through December of 2015. And we update this figure every year in the NOAA uh, BAM State of the Climate Report. And so that'll come out later this year. Uh, but what no one has seen yet is uh, this latest update with 2015 thrown in there. So that top black line there, uh, the thin one that goes up and down, that's the monthly tropospheric ozone burden um, from 60 south to 60 north. 
Um, the thick line that sort of goes up and down through it, that's the 12 month running mean. And this dashed uh, straight line through it is a straight line fit. That is a significant increase. That's an increase of 9% globally over the past 11 years. Um, the interannual variability is only about 5 teragrams, so the overall increase is 25 teragrams. Um, as I'll show later, I'm thinking this is probably due to emissions rather than um, climate variability. Down at the bottom there's the, the Nino 3.4 index, and you can see over the past um, 11, 12 years we've had several El Nino and La Ninas, and the increase is independent of whether or not we're going through an El Nino cycle. And then um, those blue and red traces, those are the, the trends by uh, the northern and southern hemisphere. <laughs> Let's move on to the next plot to see where the ozone is actually located in, in the globe. So now we're looking at uh, the tropospheric ozone burden for the whole globe. Um, this is a 11-year average using all 12 months of the year at the top, and it's in Dobson units. So you can see that um, globally there's more ozone in the northern hemisphere than in the southern. In the northern hemisphere we see hot spots over the Mediterranean, um, over India, the Bay of Bengal, and then over East Asia. Uh, those um, low ozone areas over the western U.S. and the Himalayas are just due to the, the terrain being so high that you have a, a shorter column. And then well, in the southern hemisphere um, that ozone burden is mainly driven by biomass burning. Um, from Africa and, and South America. Now if you look down at the bottom plot there, here for every 5 by 5 degree grid cell I've calculated the, the trend. And if the grid cell has a white circle, that trend is significant. And you can see that over probably about half of the globe, um, there's been a significant increase in ozone. But look where the hot spot is. It's exactly where you India. It's over Southeast Asia and it's downwind of Asia coming across the Pacific Ocean. The take home message from this standing back is that um, background ozone is really, there's a good chance it could very well increase. Um, if you move on to the next slide, let's look at how emissions have been changing globally. Um, this is um, the most recent update to the, the global um, CO2 emissions budget. And the figure down there in the, the bottom left shows the increase in CO2 emissions globally since 1960. So it started off at around 2 gigatons of carbon per year, and now we're up to nearly 10. And th through that 11-year aura record, um, the increase in CO2 emissions has gone up by 25%, which I didn't think that was right at first, but it is. It's gone up by 25%. Now, that doesn't directly correlate to NOx emissions because of controls, but given that most of that CO2 emission increase is coming from India and China, as you can see in the bottom right, where emission controls are a top priority, I think we can conclude that NOx is probably going up um, in the northern hemisphere as well. And then in the, the top right there, you can just see where the, the CO2 emissions are coming from, mainly from um, fossil fuel combustion. Okay, and then the next slide. This is just observed methane at Mauna Loa, Hawaii. As, as methane increases in the atmosphere, so does ozone. There was a leveling off in the early 2000s, but now methane is going up again. It's gone up by 4% over the past uh, decade. And then the next slide. Um, this, I, don't, I won't go into too much detail on this one. Just suffice it to say that my, my colleague, uh, Jason West at UNC Chapel Hill and his grad student have been doing a model simulation looking at the impact of the increase in um, ozone emissions since 1980 globally. And we, we did an analysis where we increased the emissions um, when they were fixed in their 1980 positions. And then we allowed the emissions to increase globally as they shifted further towards the equator. And what the model simulation shows is that for the increase in the ozone burden since 1980, half of that is due to the fact that the emissions are moving towards the equator where your ozone production efficiency is greater. So even if NOx doesn't increase, so long as we keep shipping emissions to Southeast Asia, China, and India, uh, the ozone burden will increase just because of the, uh, the production efficiency. So that's the big picture. Um, the next slide. 
Um, this is just for fun. This shows I plotted up the NOAA nighttime lights of the world in 1992. And then if you go to the next slide, you see it in 2013. And you can see the increase. And I don't know if the animation will work. If you go to the next slide, it should toggle back and forth. So you can just see the increase. So this, this is what we're up against in terms of ozone. We've got um, increasing emissions and population of wind of us. So this will be an issue um, probably for quite a few years to come. Um, next slide then, this is just our best in situ observations of ozone of wind of North America. This is the trend of Mauna Loa, Hawaii at nighttime when we're sampling the, um, the lower free troposphere and ozone's gone up by 17% over the last four years. And then looking now on the next slide, slide number 11, let's look at how ozone's been changing rurally at high elevation sites across the U.S. I'm going to compare in the East Coast three high elevation sites, uh, Whiteface Mountain, Big Meadows, Shenandoah National Park, and Cove Mountain in Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And on the West Coast, we'll compare it to Dan Jaffe's data set at Mount Bachelor and the, the National Park Service CASNET data at Lassen Volcanic National Park in Northern California. And if you go to the next slide, okay, that's just showing where the sites are in terms of emissions, which I think this audience is, is well familiar with. So let's move on to the next slide. Here I'm just showing springtime. This is the change of those three eastern sites. We're looking at the 95th percentile in the, the dotted lines and the medians, um, the solid lines. And this is just for April and May when we expect the, the strongest influence from Asia coming in across the Pacific. So, you know, good news, emission controls um, are working not just in summer but also in, in springtime in the eastern U.S. So zones coming down. Now, if you go to the next slide, we'll overlay on top of that. Um, what's been going on at Lassen Volcanic National Park. Um, emissions have been coming down in California, but ozone um, at this high elevation site is not coming down. It's doing the opposite. And there's actually now as much ozone on the West Coast as there is on the East Coast. Uh, next slide, we'll add on Mount Bachelor. It's only a 12-year record, but that's going up generally at the same rate. And if you add the next uh, line, the next slide, that's ozone in the free troposphere at three to eight kilometers above western North America. And we now have a, a 20 year record. And this is a, a composite of all the ozone songs, research aircraft, um, commercial aircraft, and LIDAR so we can get our hands on. And that's also building up at the exact same rate as uh, Lassen Volcanic National Park. So just some more evidence that in terms of the western US, at least in the springtime, um, background ozone is an ongoing issue, and it's a good chance it will offset some of the emission reductions in, in the western U.S. Um, I think, I don't want to take up too much time. Let's move on. Um, I quickly want to talk about uh, TOR, the Tropospheric Ozone Assessment Report. You go to slide number 26. This is um, a new initiative of IGAC where we're trying to mobilize the, the global ozone research community to come up with um, an overall assessment of what we know about tropospheric ozone. So that plot I just showed of, of the only MLS increase in ozone, we want to now look at all the, the surface sites around the world and, and see if that's also in, increasing at the same rate. So this should be slide 26. Um, you might have to step through about a dozen slides to get to it. 26 seems to be in the lower right there. Oh, okay. I must have a different number. Sorry. Uh, mine says 26. I guess this has been inserted into another presentation. Um, keep going about um, 10 more slides, please. There we go. That's the one. So we have our next workshop in, in Beijing um, next week. And if you go to the next slide, um, the global map. This just shows where all the, the scientists are from that are participating. We have, um, well, this slide's now outdated. We now have about 200 scientists around the world. And we just picked up about a dozen from, from China. Um, so anyway, um, there's a big effort going on at the bottom line in trying to quantify the, the changes in ozone globally. 
And then we'll also be looking at how that will impact ozone on, on the west coast of the U.S. Um, that's sort of my big picture overview. I know um, Andy Langford had some slides from the Elvis. Do you want to mention some of those, Andy? I'm going to ha hand it over to Andy Langford. If you go forward about uh, five more slides, six more slides, you'll come to the, the Elvis title slide. Uh, any, any questions for Owen? All right, I just want to talk a little bit about the Las Vegas ozone study, or ELVIS, which took place uh, in May and June of 2013. And uh, most of uh, the measurements took place uh, at a place called Angel Peak, which is about 45 kilometers west of Las Vegas itself at an elevation of just under 2.7 kilometers. And this is what it looks like from Angel Peak looking towards Las Vegas, which you can see down there in the distance. Um, the next slide just gives a little background here. And the, These slides are created on a Mac, and they're looking a little different uh, on the PC, I guess. Uh, but um, this is just showing, for example, during May of 2013, what the mean, the monthly mean for May ozone looked like at uh, a bunch of the CastNet and National Park sites. Um, and you can see that in the southwest there's a real hot spot where quite a few of the places have mean uh, ozone over 60 parts per billion. In many cases, in, in quite remote areas here. So Elvis was uh, designed, we went out there at the invitation of the Clark County Department of Air Quality, and they supported much of this work um, to uh, try to help them understand where this ozone is coming from, how much might be just coming from Los Angeles or from Asia, wildfires, or what might be coming from the stratosphere. The next slide just provides a little background here. And, and, and one of the things, you know, not to go through this whole talk, but um, just a little nutshell here up front is why does the southwest have so much higher background ozone in the springtime than the rest of the U.S.? Um, and part of this is because the southwestern U.S seems to be one of the global hotspots for deep stratospheric intrusions. Uh, that is, intrusions that get down to about three kilometers or less in the atmosphere. So they have more potential for affecting surface concentrations. And then there are a couple of reasons for this. One is the proximity to the North Pacific storm track. And another probably is, is the, uh, the semi-permanent East Pacific High, which causes subsidence on the West Coast, which might tend to bring some of these intrusions down uh, deeper than they would have otherwise. Uh, these intrusions are, are also taking place over the eastern U.S., but they're not impacting surface ozone. And one of the reasons is they're not penetrating as deeply in the atmosphere. One of the other things which we hear a lot of talk about is the role of elevation. And, and, and quite obviously, if you have isentropically descending stratospheric air, uh, the odds that that's going to intercept the surface are, are, are going to go up with elevation. That the higher you are, the more likely some of this will, will come to you if, if it's descending isentropically. Furthermore, the high mountain ranges of the West, the Rockies and Sierras and smaller ranges, can uh, also tie into this by when ozone reaches this, the, the tops of these high mountains, then some of the orographically driven uh, diurnal flows, for example, or wave effects could bring them down into the surrounding valleys that are more populated. So this, this is kind of where we are right now. I'm just going to say right now I'm working on a paper, which uh, I hope to, to finish soon, which, which is using the Elvis data to try to understand really why is the Southwest such a hot spot. And really, the key finding of this is one of the biggest factors we haven't talked much about is really the deep boundary layers in the southwest and the intermountain west during April and May, during May and June, which are often three to four kilometers. So that is a much bigger factor, I think, than elevation itself. Because if you have a four kilometer deep boundary layer, you could, you could be at sea level and then you're going up there and mixing down some of that ozone, which has made it down to four kilometers. So I think that is a bigger factor than elevation. 
which is consistent with what we saw during Kalanix, for example, when we saw stratospheric intrusions getting all the way down to sea level in the Los Angeles area. And uh, during Elvis, of course, even though Angel Peak is up there at 2.7 kilometers, um, Las Vegas itself is down at about 600 meters, which, you know, not that high elevation. And that ozone made it down there to the surface uh, at 600 meters or so. So I think I think that's something we haven't talked about that, uh, that, that really is a key player here. It's the deep boundary layers. All right, just moving aside here uh, to the next slide. This just shows for Calnex, which May and June of 2010, um, the uh, mean contribution over that period of ozone from the stratosphere and ozone transported from Asia as calculated by Mei Young Lin using uh, the, the uh, NOAA GFDL AM3 model. And you see a couple of things. One is the patterns are very, very similar with much higher contributions in the southwestern U.S. than in the east, particularly along the Gulf Coast and the south where the contributions are very small. They look very similar. But the stratospheric contribution during these months is about four times as big as the contribution from Asia. So it, it really plays a much bigger role in uh, the southwest in May and June than transport across the Pacific. The reason they look so similar is that much of that trans-Pacific transport actually is, is, takes place with stratospheric intrusions. That is that much of the precursors in OX and VOCs that are being emitted in Asia are entrained into the warm conveyor belt of uh, the developing cyclones over East Asia and then carried across the Pacific that way. And then when the stratospheric intrusions form in the Eastern Pacific, they entrain a lot of that polluted air from Asia. So very often, you know, in measurements we would see um, stratospheric air of clear stratospheric air that is either preceded or followed by uh, polluted air that has a signature of coming from Asia. But again, the contribution from the stratosphere is much bigger. I'm pushing 20 minutes now. Okay, so, so uh, let's move ahead. Um, that just shows the next slide. This just shows that the highest ozone in Clark County is in May and June. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Elvis itself. Let's just keep moving ahead to uh, this would be slide 50, 50 perhaps. And these slides are here for your convenience. And, and the paper is out there in atmospheric environment. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. You'll get to a slide that, uh, oh, stop right here. Let's back up one. All right. It went, one before this. All right. This is just showing, summarizing the results from Elvis, which took place over six weeks. And what I plotted here is the MVA8 ozone uh, measured within the regulatory monitors in Clark County. And I plotted on top of that uh, the measurements actually at Angel Peak, which were up on the mountain. Uh, and those are shown in gray. And you can see that they're very highly correlated there. And there were three exceedances of the 75 part per billion standard, 2008 standard, during Elvis, two of which took place only a few days apart in, uh, in late May. And um, again, what we found is that ozone was high at Angel Peak. And by looking at correlations with CO, we could determine that it was much of it was coming from the stratosphere. But the next day, as the boundary layer grew, that ozone ended up being entrained over Las Vegas itself. The next slide just shows that over that period at the end of May, what the, uh, the monitors here in red are those which exceeded 75 parts per billion. And um, on May 21st, and again on May 25th, there were quite a few monitors in, in the Eastern, Southern, Southeastern California, and also Nevada, which uh, where we're seeing the effect of those stratospheric intrusions. The next slide shows the same thing, um, but what would happen if the standard had been lowered to 65? And, and 70, where we ended up, would be somewhere in between. That not only do you have 
uh, a lot of exceedances that you might call exceptional events on two of those days, but the high average background associated with, with um, that, those intrusions being spread out over a large area actually made it, uh, got nine consecutive days here where ozone would have exceeded 65 parts per million standard. And I'll stop here and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you so much to, to Dave and Owen and Andrew. Uh, if folks uh, have questions, feel free to type those in in the bottom right. And, and like I said, we'll uh, go ahead and send around a copy of those slides in PDF form uh, so, so there may be additional questions that are coming. But I know we've got maybe a couple that have come in. Uh, the first one, and I think this probably uh, goes to Owen, um, is related to, to the, the sites that uh, you have mentioned both in the east and, and west. Uh, and kind of the offsetting of, of NOx reductions that we were seeing uh, on the West Coast. And I think there was a related study that came out, uh, I believe led by NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in the last year that, that seemed to indicate that in Nevada and California, you had close to 50% of NOx reductions in the last few years potentially offset by Asian contributions. Could, oh, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that study and, and if there's any indication of kind of between those sites and the, the East Coast and the West Coast, if there's any indication of how much uh, less bang for our buck we're getting in NOx reductions as a result of background ozone or international contributions or kind of what the, where the science is at there and, or, or maybe research questions that are uh, out there in the future for your team or others to, to take a look at in terms of uh, those contributions. Um, in terms of you know, direct transport of ozone, from, from Asia in terms of plumes impacting the surface. You know, we're not focusing on, on the eastern U.S. at all. The way that the, the atmosphere is structured thermally, um, for those air masses to get down to the surface, they're really gonna, only going to impact the, the high elevation regions of, of the western U.S. and they'll just sort of shoot right over um, the eastern U.S. Now, that's not to say, though, that, that, that it, those increases in ancient emissions won't raise the general Northern Hemisphere background ozone, which will then, you know, sort of spread around the world, um, all, all around the Northern Hemisphere, and, and raise background levels almost uniformly. But in terms of the actual plumes, we're really only focusing on the Western U.S. That uh, NASA JPL study that came out, they used they only used about six or seven years of satellite data from the test instrument, which is still operating. It's on ARA, like OMI and MLS, but it's um, it's dying essentially. Um, there's very li very limited power left on it, and they can only make very limited measurements these days. So they're not able to continue that study on um, to the present day like we can with OBMLS. But the findings in that study were basically consistent with um, the other observational and, and modeling studies, in that um, it all makes sense that the increase in emissions uh, from Asia does boost ozone, in, especially in springtime. And that does come across the Pacific Ocean and impact the high elevation regions of, of the western United States. Now, it's not like you're ever going to be you know, hit by 50 ppb of ozone coming in from Asia. It's only going to raise your, um, your local ozone by something on the order of 5 to 15 ppb, um, which isn't much you know, if your local ozone is 150 ppb in the boundary layer. But if you're a site where your, your ozone um, is around 71 ppb, and it, it does make a difference. Great, thanks so much. And, and we've got a few other questions in, and, and like I say, feel free to type, type additional ones. Uh, one, one question, and, and we'll throw it open to the group, is what are your thoughts on the high SSP levels over Canada? SST, that's stratosphere for exchange or sea surface temperature. <laughs> STT? Yep, I, I, I think stratosphere. Yeah, so I mean, in, in terms of Western North America, I mean, we, we expect high stratotrope exchange um, all along the, the West Coast, but it, I, I believe the figure that Andy showed, um, that analysis using, I think, 30 years of ECWF data. I believe the impact is strongest over, over California. Um, yeah, it's, it's stronger over the, the southwest U.S. than it is over um, Canada. 
Um, and that's just because the, the way these air masses descend isentropically from the stratosphere, they're more likely to intercept the surface um, in the subtropics rather than the, the high latitudes. Now, over Canada, those intrusions are very strong well above the surface. But this particular figure shows where they splash down and actually hit the surface. And, and that's going to be the high elevation regions of the, the southwest US. Deep boundary layers. Yes, deep boundary layers. Great. Now, I think uh, we've got a few other questions in. Uh, one being, how were estimates of CO2 emissions from China created? I think that was one of the earlier slides. Yeah, um, I mean, I would have to go back and, and look at the paper. I, I gave the reference in there. I'm not sure exactly how they calculate um, all, all the CO2 emissions. I, I assume they just tally up um, how much um, fossil fuels they burn and then just have um, conversion factors to get the, the amount of CO2 coming out. But if, if you go to that paper that's referenced, that they explain it all in very great detail. Great. And I think we just had a couple other questions that, that came in. One, one being, as, as state and local agencies are, are taking a look at EPA's background, ozone white paper, and thinking about the tools, including exceptional events, uh, but, but I guess more specifically in the context of this presentation, the, uh, the use of uh, provisions dealing with international transport, are, are there any seminal studies or, or recent research that if you were an agency new to this topic wanting to, to look at non-North American international contributions in a way that might be helpful to, to use the provisions under Section 179B um, of, of the Clean Air Act that, that maybe states could, could start by looking at or resources in terms of uh, getting them up to speed on, on kind of what's been written about international contributions and how to characterize it? Yes, so um, the United Nations uh, sponsored task force on hemispheric transport of air pollution had a report uh, that came out in 2011, which is the most recent um, sort of synthesis of everything the community knows about um, international transport. And there's some great um, model ensemble studies that indicate how um, certain continents are, are affected by upwind continents. Now, that, of course, is five years old now, um, and there are newer studies. But if, if you want a place to start, um, then it's that report. And I can send Clint the, the reference for that. It can be um, downloaded online for free. Great. We'd be glad to, glad to distribute that out. And I believe that's all the questions we have in so far. We'll maybe give folks just a couple more a couple more seconds here to submit questions, but I want to make sure to, th to to use this opportunity to thank all of our speakers from, from NOAA and US EPA um, and, and, and for sharing their expertise. We'll plan on sending out the slides from both presentations, uh, hopefully this afternoon, to the APCA membership. And, and I know we've got contact information in there uh, for our speakers. But just want to see if there's anything else that, that anyone, uh, any of our presenters would like to, to, to close with, uh, maybe starting with uh, with NOAA or any other comments that uh, may be helpful for state agencies as they prepare comments and think about how to uh, implement or revise NACs uh, in light of, of recent science on background ozone. Any other comments that, that our speakers from NOAA would like to make? Yeah, Clint, uh, Dave Fahey, I'll make uh, two comments. One is I'm glad you're going to send out these slides. There's a lot of information that these guys have put together coalescing their talks. Um, one thing that you've already learned from Andy's talk is that we're guys who go out in the field and actually look at how much ozone is there. And we take the data that everyone else has uh, posted or acquired and try and make uh, synthesize a message from that. So that's a really long-standing and large investment in this division of the federal laboratory. And we will can plan on continuing that, and which I would think would be a message of reassurance uh, to this listening group. Um, and then I'll just put in one little plug. If you look in Andy's uh, slides near the end, for his angel peak measurements in Las Vegas, what he didn't get time to tell you was the tools that we're using. So we have a scanning LIDAR system where we can see several kilometers either up or horizontally 
and can see how much ozone is along that site path. And so one of these slides, you'll actually see ozone from the stratosphere caught in the act, so to speak, coming from the stratosphere to the surface. And so that measurement capability um, is really unique. As far as I know, it's the only system in the world that can do that. But we can't use it everywhere. So we're, use, we're a process-oriented group. We want to go uh, document these things and understand and then reason what their impact is. So again, a message of reassurance that we are very interested in continuing those kind of investments and understanding the processes and then synthesizing messages out of all of the data that we and others collect. The other thing is um, 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 <clears throat> Owen might have gone by too quickly about his tour um, activity. This is under the International Global Atmospheric Chemistry Project. So we are on the international stage, he showed that, pulling together a message about background ozone from the globe. And this has never been done before. And Owen has assembled quite a large group of international collaborators. This is self-organized, in some sense self-funded, but it fills an extremely important gap that I would think the people on this call will be very interested in seeing get completed. So it will be completed as a group of published papers that will probably not appear until next calendar year. But he's going to China next week to have an international author meeting to, uh, to work on the details, uh, which of course there's very many. So again, a message of reassurance to the group on this phone that organizations like ours are really trying to strengthen, expand, and refine the scientific basis that any discussion of background ozone, either in our nation or in the world, would be based on. And we're pleased that people were called in today to hear what we had to say. And um, I would also, we consider people on this call as the stakeholders for our research. And so there's more questions that occur in the coming days or months or even the year. Um, Clint will make available the emails that go along with the voices you heard today. And we'll be highly motivated to help answer whatever your questions point you to other people or resources so that um, the conceptual understanding and the quantitative detail uh, appear wherever they need to appear, uh, to appear in, uh, in our nation's regulatory process. So I'll conclude that. Great. Well, well, thank you so much. And, and are there any other uh, any, any other additional concluding comments from, from any of our presenters? Great. Well, I want to thank thank everyone for joining us. I think we had over over 50 participants on the call on the webinar today. And like I say, we'll go ahead and, and send around, make sure that everyone has the contact information uh, for all of our presenters, these slides in PDF form, as well as the links to uh, the registration and, and workshop white paper from US EPA. And with that, with that, we'll go ahead and adjourn this presentation and get the resources out to everyone with our uh, uh, significant gratitude for, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to, to talk with the AFCA membership today. Thank you.